love to hear about what the transition has been, how you handle going from being the PTL to being the PTL. You know what I mean? Like, how do you transfer that knowledge? How long have you been active so that you could easily do it? We're still figuring it out. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let's see. Let me start with this. So I was PTL for Swift forever and doing, uh, doing whatever was needed to do to do that, and the community was. I mean, people would continue to come up in the community to uh, take more active uh, roles and things like that, which was great. But outside of the community, my role was changing a little bit at SwiftStack, and uh, kind of over the past year, I've been transitioning into doing some different things. And so I realized that I was not able to continue to attempt to do both something inside, more inside of my company, and also a BTL job, and do a decent job at either one of them. And so I decided to step down and kind of kicked off that process internally by um, kind of sharing that up front with uh, the core developers uh, a few months ago. Uh, but, that, but that sort of thing, I, I, I guess, how did, how did that process go? Uh, which part? <laughs> okay, so I sent an email and said, yeah. hey, by the way, I'm, I'm not going to be BTL. Good luck. Figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling and bleeding. <laughs> so uh, the rest of us, uh, we kind of discussed amongst ourselves. And uh, you know, one of the long-running jokes in the Swift community is that the reason that John always runs unopposed is that nobody else really wants the job. That wasn't entirely the case. Uh, like other people, uh, who, I think there were maybe what three of us or so who were uh, thinking to themselves, "Well, you know, this seems like the sort of thing that I could probably stretch myself a bit and get into this." And that's part of the thing that I was totally confident with, with when I said, "I'm not going to do it. Figure out how you want to handle this." Any one the, of them would have been great. Every single person on the core team would have done an excellent job at it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think maybe I was the first one to really put my head above the uh, parapet. And uh, so here I am. Uh, it has an advantage in that uh, I've always kind of expressed a bit of an interest in some of the uh, uh, sorts of duties that John had as PTL. I just kind of wandered by his desk. And, like, so. Uh, yeah. I've got these stable patches that I, I've proposed, and I need to make sure that you actually land them. Or, uh, so how do you go cutting a release and things like that? So I've got something of a leg up there, I feel like. And it's helpful that I can always just wander down the hall and uh, ask him if I forget. And that's the thing, over the past month or so, uh, Tim and I have been working pretty closely about uh, what a transition looked like, the last big release we did. Uh, kind of working on the mechanics of that, trying to figure out what's going on, preparing for this week, um, even to this extent of wandering around the halls. It's like, you need to meet this person. I'd like them to know who you are and, and things like that. So just, uh, we have been working very closely and it's not like I'm leaving or going away. I'm still um, staying at SwiftStack. I'm still uh, gonna be actively involved in Swift as a key component of storage infrastructure in the world, just not as directly day-to-day -day involved as far as leadership in the source project. I would love to hear then what, what what happened in Stein, and then what you're doing in Train, as well as what it was like to like hand off in Stein and take over in Train. Because this is your first PTL, yeah, or PTG as PTL. Yes, right. Uh, so first Stein. For Stein, in the, we had. Uh, a lot of continuation of work that we have been working on uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, let's see, what were the big the big things that we wrapped up? I, Stein encompasses several independent releases of Swift, themself, of Swift itself. So we, uh, we, we added a bunch of additional S3 comp uh, compatibility, and that was a really big deal. It's, it's more so than just adding features, but also adding behavior mimicry of AWS S3. Uh, so that clients can do that more seamlessly. Um, 
it, we added some improvements into erasure codes, especially multi-region erasure codes, and optimizing uh, how much data, or hopefully a little less data, uh, is needed to be synchronized across a WAN between two disparate regions. And uh, let's see, what were the other big things we had? So, um, but the great thing about that is it's not been this kind of, um, I mean, everybody shows a lot of leadership in the community anyway, so it wasn't, it was really more along the lines of, I'm the one who used to stand up and give the talks. Now, Tim was not able to be here earlier this week, so I was still able to do this last project update at the summit on Monday, and I, I gave a lot more of a holistic history of SWIFT, um, rather than here is specifically what we just did in the last six months, so starting in 2006 and came up for the last 13 years. Of I would like to hear. So the thing is with, uh, this is really gets into, I'll tell you my, here's the, here's the summary thing that I like talking about. Back in 2006, the world was very different from uh, cloud technology. It was this brand new cutting edge thing that a few people had an idea on based on some technology that had been roughly talked about over the last 10 years previous to that. And we had started creating some interesting things as an industry. And one of those first things that uh, came out very, very early was AWS S3. Here's a large programmatic storage behind an API. That was kind of new, not POSIX, but ultimately scalable and easy to consume. At the time, Rackspace had a bunch of customers in their, uh, in their managed hosting business that was asking for how do we do something similar Build, we have this idea of how to take advantage of some virtualization and some more uh, horizontally scalable applications, but we'd like to pair it with a, a good scalable storage system. Can we have something? And so some people inside of Rackspace started building that and built a, the, the precursor to Swift. Uh, to, to accelerate some of that story, the, what really happened is it was successful, it launched, and everything was great, except that the architecture of that system wasn't as scalable as it needed to be. It had a, a very, it had a very large single point of failure uh, that was rather hard to, uh, to to run and maintain over time from a sysadmin and operator's perspective. So that led to the creation of Swift in 2009, where the Rackspace executive said, "You can rewrite it, you can uh, start over, but the only thing is the customers can't know." Which means that you have to maintain the same API. And so which has been massively beneficial to Swift, I feel like. We, as much as possible, never break APIs. A client that you wrote five years ago, 10 years ago, can still hit Swift and be happy. That's right. Even this precursor system that was launched in 2007 or 8 or something like that, a client for that can still talk to Swift today and still continue to work and read and write its done. That leads into some challenges of some of the future stuff that we're working on, whereas when we create new features and work about worry about major migrations and translations of what's happening in the system, we have to account for data that was in fact serialized down to disk ten years ago and making sure that that is still a compatible thing. But to get kind of back into the story there, uh, we in 2009 Swift uh, the creation of Swift as a code base was started, and in 2010 then it was launched into production May 17 of 2010 just about to turn nine years old. And then later that summer, uh, the Open, or Rackspace and NASA came together and said, we have this new project called OpenStack, we're gonna open source it, and here it is to the world. So what's happened since then, or the, you know, the point of what happened then, kind of the original why, why did it matter right then, is that we had two fundamental needs to, that led to the creation of Swift. One was from an application, an end user, uh, client perspective. How do we have storage that is scalable, available, and I don't have to worry about those hard problems of storage? I write an application, all I have to do is send bytes to it and get bytes back. Uh, there's lots of different interesting things we've added on and you can add to that that give um, a lot more value and power to that system. But the basic idea is how do I write more modern apps in a more horizontally scalable way and pair it with a storage system that can that is also just as equally scalable as my compute. The second thing that is fundamental to this and has driven most of the developments or most of the, uh, it's always been in the back of our mind with any sort of development in Swift over the past 10 years, is what is it like to run this in production? 
how do we, how does this affect the operator's life? How do we make the simple things easy, and how do we make the hard, the the, the complex things easy, uh, simpler? And so, uh, we know that we have to automatically handle failures, but not all failures are the same. So, can we just simply work around something transparently, as opposed to needing an operator to handle things? How can we make sure that we reduce configuration options? How do we make sure that we have simplistic config files that don't have to change all the time and still are backwards and forwards compatible. Those sort of things are vitally important uh, because if you can't run it in production, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't matter how good it is for the client. And when you're talking about running these days clusters that have dozens and dozens of petabytes and span continents, it's the only way that that's possible is when it's simple to run. So, all of that being said, the whole reason we started here is still applicable today. More than ever, we have the need for, and it's not just a good idea, but applications have the requirement for uh, the same sort of scalable storage. We have seen that in, in, in large part, the industry is sort of caught up to the, the cutting edge of 10 years ago when we started, where we don't just talk about virtualization and how to scale that out, but now more and more people are actually using that. They're moving on to new things like uh, containerization and even more scalability and, and stateless applications, and then looking into things like uh, functions as a service with serverless computing or whatever that's going to be uh, look like in the future. Even more than ever, you still require the need. You, you still require scalable storage to go alongside that. So. That's the fundamental, like, why does this thing exist here? But there is an even more good behind it, in my opinion, is that back in 2010, when this was open source as part of one of the two uh, starting projects of OpenStack, we did something that is the bigger impact overall, and that is make the code and the design of the project overall open for all to contribute to. If we had not, if the only, there's obviously many other closed storage systems out there that are uh, scalable and available, S3 being the biggest and the uh, most popular one. But if these systems, if, if scalable storage is only available for, for modern apps, is, is only available through a closed proprietary system, then we, we don't know how to, we, we forget as an industry how to make these cutting edge things. Like we, everything that we made is built on the shoulders of the people who came before us. So if we don't share how we build cutting edge storage technology today, then we are not well positioned at all to account for the problems that we're going to have in five to 10 years from now. And so that is why, despite the fact that it is important to reduce barriers to entry to support an S3 API to build inroads to allow people to easily consume the storage, it's vitally important that the system itself is open source and does cap, uh, control over its own destiny for an API that it defines so that we are not simply mimicking some proprietary system out there, whether that's S3 or something else. We need to make sure that not only the cutting edge technology, but the way in which you make and build and design and run the cutting edge technology is open and available to all so that we have this, the continued ability for everybody to have control and own ownership of their own data. It does not need to be locked behind any kind of proprietary interface. So overall, that's been my passion for Swift over the past 10 years. And that's where we've gotten, um, that was the history lesson I basically I was talking about of um, why, why did we start in the very beginning and that lesson matters now more than, more than ever. So that's why I'm still, it, it's been sort of bittersweet to, to step back from that because I'm, I'm very passionate about it. Um, but I'm not worried. Uh, I know that um, the whole community uh, and, led, and led by Tim will do an excellent job with continuing to maintain that vision of how do we get Swift to be used by everyone every day, whether we realize it or not. And with that in mind, what are you focusing on in trade? Well, no uh, pressure. <laughs> So for train, uh, the, the highest priority in my mind right now is Pi 3 compatibility. We've been putting it off for a long time. Uh, finally, we have 
convinced our employers that, uh, it, yes, this really is going to be a problem. They're going to have customers asking, wondering, why are you still on a Python that is about to be EOL? Uh, but it's complicated, it's hard, in large part because of the things like John said, where you have data that was written down 10 years ago, and I still need to be able to read it. I still need to make sure that it's highly available and durable and uh, not corrupted. Turns out customers like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we've been making steady progress on Pi 3. Uh, I think the last check on Master, we had something like 70% of our unit tests passing. I've got the patch chain uh, in progress to get us functional tests. Uh, but the functional tests, that's just the client accessible API that is still a small fraction of everything that Swift needs to be able to do. Uh, I have some confidence based on how much unit test coverage we have and how well the functional tests have been going that uh, the replication and durability guarantees shouldn't be too bad, but uh, we can't know until it's actually done and we have thoroughly tested it. So uh, I'm hoping to get uh, Pi 3 compatibility to the point where we can declare at least experimental support in the near future, uh, cut a release ahead of train so that uh, we have some time for burn-in, uh, rooting out those last few bugs before we uh, get to cut a stable train branch and have uh, proper Pi 3 support. There are, of course, other interesting things going on. We've got uh, general task queue work that is making steady progress uh, this week. And uh, As an explanation on that, that one yeah. is really cool because there's this idea of more than just reading and writing the data. How do we, how do we decorate a subset of some data to do something? Mm -hmm. um, over time, and that may be, let's move it from replicated storage to erasure coded. Let's expire it after a little while. Let's move it to a whole other cluster someplace. These kind of operations are things that people are asking their storage systems to do. Uh, but and, and we have support for lots of these uh, things. And the task queue work is something that's been led by NTT so far, and it is um, a way to. Uh, not only unify several of these disparate implementations of these different features, but also to give us a powerful and flexible way to build more capabilities on top of it. And in and of itself, make it uh, something that is a, uh, a scalable system, uh, a scalable inf uh, framework for those features inside of the cluster itself. So we've got that Pi 3, we've got Task Queue, uh, we've got, of course, more S3 compatibility like version. Yeah, and that, that's an ongoing uh, struggle. Always, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Turns out Amazon can always add new features. <laughs> uh, so notable uh, on the list of S3 API features that we want to add is support for object versioning. Mm. Uh, this is something that we've seen a lot of customers ask about. Uh, and I think that Swift's own uh, concept of versioning will benefit a lot from us uh, solving the S3 problems. Things like being able to just write data once. Uh, the way the Swift versioning works today, you, you write to a primary location and on an overwrite you have to copy it somewhere else and then you overwrite. Uh, which of course makes it so you're doubling your network bandwidth potentially. Uh, by just putting data where it's going to live long term straight away and leaving a link uh, back to it uh, in the primary location, I think Swift will benefit greatly and it solves a lot of our problems for uh, dealing with S3 version. Is, uh, what are your thoughts on having the PTG and the Summit merge? Uh, were you both here the whole time? No. So yes. I, yeah, yes. John has been here the whole 
weak and seems exhausted for it. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, He's like, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, what's your second question? I want to know how to prep things. Right, right, okay, exactly. Yeah. So the second question then is, um, like, what are your thoughts around Summit and PTG in China? Like, are you going to be able to send your whole team? Da 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 da. So like, however you want to kind of think about those two questions together or not answer, you know, feel free to go either way. I, I have. I really want to answer the first question, <laughs> and I can talk about. It. I hope it's on the second one, but I think that's really best coming. So this is, this is uh, we've, we've rejoined the summits in the PTG back in uh, co-located in the same week. And for the most part, I am a huge fan of it. I think it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, personally, I wish we would have never split things, but uh, we did and that's fine. Uh, we, we, we do what we can and uh, be flexible. But um, this week has been really, really beneficial. And the reason that I think that it is so good to have them joined um, I mean, the reality here is that, um, no, there weren't devs here the entire week. But sometimes there, there were some people here the, the whole week. And what I think what you get is this. There's an additional like, kind of energy in the room about when you are talking to people who are running the software, um, even if it's um, more of the, quote, marketing style people, uh, you still get a lot closer to what's actually happening in the field, in, in production, with the software that we're worrying about creating. And when you keep those very close together, and physically close together, it gives a sense of energy where you can go back and forth. And I had quite a number, a good number of successful conversations with people looking to continue to expand out how you do storage and being able to talk about that because we're all right here was incredibly convenient. Now, going into the second half of this week, yes, guess what, I was exhausted, but you know, it happens twice a week, and, I mean, twice a year, and so that's kind of the job. I mean, like, it's okay to be tired after having a really long week, that's, that's the point. Uh, you don't do this every single week, but when you are together, it's an opportunity that you really just have to grab onto and make the most of. So I really love it going into the second half of the week. It means that we can immediately carry in those kind of conversations into what are we talking about with the actual um, plans to implement designs for new features. And so I'm a huge fan of it. Um, I do think that going on to Saturday is a bad idea, but uh, I would have preferred some more overlap. So uh, it's just five days only in total, but that's, um, that's where we are. Uh, so uh, I wasn't here for the summit portion, uh, my son's birthday was Tuesday, and there are just some red lines that will not be crossed. <laughs> it's his first birthday. It's, no. You just don't miss that. As, <laughs> you don't miss that. That said, uh, I do kind of regret not being able to be at the summit and talking to customers, seeing how the software is getting used. Uh, I remember that was one of the things I really enjoyed at my first summit back in Vancouver, the first time. Uh, seeing how people actually build things out of the stuff that you've written is amazing. I love it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's the thing that gives you the energy to get through the rest of the week, the rest of the six months. It's great. When we think about, and Tim and I have seen these kind of thing, uh, both, well, just in general in the Swift ecosystem, the kind of things that we see Swift being used for now, the things that we hear, with the places where we hear Swift being used for, are just, I mean, personally, I'm still blown away by all of the things that, that, we, that we hear about, we see, um, whether it's running infrastructure for cell phones at telcos, whether it's making movies, um, supporting major games, or uh, developing so, self-driving cars. Swift was recently, um, chosen as part of the reference architecture from NVIDIA for their autonomous driving unit, where you have just racks and racks of GPUs and petabytes and petabytes of object, Swift object storage. And that is the way that NVIDIA is promoting. This is how you grab terabytes to petabytes of data off the cars every single week and figure out how to make them drive themselves. It's so cool to see that stuff happen. Switching over to China. Yeah. yeah. So uh, 
China's going to be interesting and fun. Uh, I've never been to China. Uh, I actually don't know that any of our Swift. So here's the thing. We certainly yeah. have Swift contributors from China. Yeah. But uh, the number of patches is uh, not oh. near as many as. Uh, but that's been one of the things that I know that I've struggled with as PTL over the last few years. And Figuring that out how we have to do this right. How do we yeah. do this? Um, for the most part, uh, in a lot of ways, we have done a huge swath of the world large disservices. I mean, we organize our meetings such that it's nighttime from China through India. And you're like, well, there's only two billion people there. I mean, surely there's some people who would be a great, great contributor to SWIFT. And as a community, we have not positioned ourselves to really take advantage of that. But I would like to see that change. I wish I could have uh, done some more things along those lines um, in the past few years. Uh, but I am excited about the opportunity of having a summit in China. Because small, from everything I've heard over the years, I mean, like a small event in China has merely 5,000 people at it. And when we compare that to what the summits have looked like uh, in North America and Europe recently, it's, I mean, multiples bigger. So there's a huge opportunity there, but there's also huge barriers that we have to figure out how to overcome. And I think that it is absolutely necessary that our community, that we change what we look like when you walk into the room. And the people look different, the people talk different, the people um, behave in different ways, and we have to be able to account for that. And that's something that I know that I've learned a huge amount um, over the years growing in the SWIFT community as we work across a global set of cultures. And I honestly, I don't know what the answers are. I don't know how to do that well, other than to make yourself available and listen. But I'm looking forward to China, but I'm also nervous and kind of there's a little bit of nervous, nervous anticipation there because I don't really know how to capture the possibility of what is there. You're both going. I, I know that Tim is going. I honestly don't know if I'm going to be going. I may, I may not, but also it's Tim's job now. So uh, I know that Tim's going to do a great job yep. at figuring out how to solve the China problem. <laughs> well, do you, either of you have anything you want to add? hopes for the next, hopes for the rest of the week. I mean, we only have a day and a half left, but a lot can happen in a day and a half. It's all you. You get to talk about the vision. Yeah, yeah. hopes the and that. visions. Uh, mainly, it's just continuing John's vision of seeing Swift being used by everyone, everywhere, every day, whether you realize it or not is a fantastic vision and is one that I am happy to carry on.